Hi, uh, my name is Anthony, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Elm. Uh, so first off, what is Elm? Elm is a purely functional programming language for front-end web development. So what does it mean to be a functional web, uh, functional programming language versus what most of you are probably used to, which is an imperative style? So traditionally, programming languages consist of uh, a series of statements, which are instructions that are executed in order. Um, and imperative languages have mutable state, and functions may have side effects. Um, in functional languages, programs consist of a series of expressions, which are generally functions in the mathematical sense, in that given the same input, they will always return the same output, and state will not be mutated. So why would you want to use Elm in particular? Uh, it's designed to be a very beginner-friendly introduction to functional programming, and it's specifically designed with the needs of JavaScript developers in mind, uh, and especially keeping in mind the fact that they may not have worked with functional languages before. It's statically typed, meaning that every variable has a, uh, a type assigned to it, and once that type has been given, it can't be changed, and all data is uh, immutable. Both of those two things combined end up meaning that there are no runtime exceptions in Elm. If something will fail, it will fail at compile time and not at runtime. It, uh, it offers consistent management of state using the Elm architecture, which is actually very similar to Redux. It's also interoperable with, uh, with JavaScript, which means that, there, that you can embed your, your app into, so you can write part of your app in Elm and leave the rest of it in JavaScript and slowly port it over if you want to. And you, get, you can have bi-directional data flow between the two languages. So with that in mind, let's talk about functions, which are sort of the heart of functional programming languages. And here is an example of what a ba very basic function would look like in Elm. So we have add one. The colon means that this is a function that has the following type. It takes a number and returns a number and it would be defined as add one x equals x plus one. So if we want to expand that out and give it two parameters, it's very similar, but we, we chain the arrows. So we have a number, then a second number also as an argument, and we re still return a number and define that as add x, y equals x plus y. So the reason that the, the arguments are chained like that is because Elm features partial, partial application, which means that if you have a function that takes multiple parameters, and you only give it one, for example, what you get back is a function itself with the first parameter applied, and you, and you end up with just a function. So for example, if we define a function that always adds two to a number, we can define that in terms of the original add by simply applying, use, uh, simply calling the original add with just two, and we get back a function with where x is two, and it will always add two plus y. You can also compose functions. So if we have a function called isEven that takes an integer and returns a Boolean that's true if the number is even, we can use this um, composition arrow, which t takes a function that takes a value of type B and returns a value of type C, a second function that goes from A to B. And it will return a function that takes a value of type A and gives you a value of type C. So using this, we can define another function, isOdd, by composing the not function which flips a Boolean, and our isEven function. There was, we can also use function application, which is essentially syntactic sugar for parentheses. And it works very similarly to, um, to pipes in Unix. So for example, if we wanted to define a function that takes a list of numbers and gives us a string, we could take our list, pipe it into uh, list.filter, which takes a filtering function, and returns the elements that match that that ma that meet their criteria defined by the filter, so that gives us another list back. We then pipe that into list.length in this case, which will now give us a number, which we now pipe into two string and get a string back out. You could also define this using function composition, and so in the example below that, we're actually not even supplying um, the arguments in the function definition. We're just defining it purely purely in terms of other functions. Elm also offers pattern matching, which is a lot like a switch statement in JavaScript, but 
it's able to sort of destructure the value that you're switching on. So for in this example, we're taking a list of numbers and returning a number, which is the length of the list. So we're in, in this example, we say ca case list of, which is performing the pattern match. So if it matches an empty array, we always want to return 0 as our length. Otherwise, um, we want to destructure that list into the first element, x, and the remainder of the list, xs. And we'll return um, the, the first value plus the value that we get from recursively calling list sum on the remainder of the list. We can do some, the same thing with length, except we don't care what the first element is. We can use this wildcard operator, uh, which is the underscore. And then instead of returning uh, the value plus the, the sum, we return 1 plus the recursive length. <coughs> in addition, functions are first order in Elm, similar to JavaScript. So this is just a, an example of how you would define um, filtering of a list using pattern matching. You can also define your own types or, t or aliases for existing types. So for example, here we're creating a type alias of username and it, just saying that it is a string. You can also create new types, which in this example, we're creating a type message, which can either be increment, decrement, or set value and a value, which we can then use to pattern match on, which you'll see in a second once I get into the general architecture. So as you'll see, this is very similar to Elm. You have three things, a model, which contains the state of your application, an update, which is how you go from one state to the next, and a view which takes your state and returns what it should look like. So your model can be any format you want it to be. Here it's a, a record, which is basically a JavaScript object that has a field called value, which is a number. An update takes a message, which is something that you define yourself, and a model, and it gives you a new model back. So, for, so here we're pattern matching on the message that we've defined. And if it's increment, we return a new model, but update the value to be the value plus one. And for, for set value, we destructure on that field. So we, what we get back is set value and a value variable, which we can then assign to the value field on the new model that we're returning. And the view is the way that we convert the model into the rendered HTML. And this looks a lot like JSX in React. But the main difference is that the functions you're using, the, the way you're defining your HTML is actually using native Elm functions rather than sort of the way that React does it with where it's syntactic sugar over create class. And this is what it would look like. So we have a function called div, for example, that takes a list of attributes, which is empty here, and a list of child nodes. In this case, a span with some buttons and a div with another button. And on the buttons, we're defining um, the onClick property, which will onClick will produce a message of type decrement, for example, for the minus button. Uh, so let me pull that up here. That, so this is what that, that program looks like. So each time I click one of these buttons, it's firing the associated event, which is being passed into update along with the current model and returning it a new model which is then passed back to the view, and so on. And that, that's just the same application with the addition of a reset button. And that's what it, that's, this is what it looks like visually. So it's essentially you're just passing messages to update, which returns a new model, which then gets rendered by your view, produces messages, which get fed back into update, and so on. And I'm, I'm just going to do a quick live code um, where what I'm going to do is just make a simple application that has an input box that you can type into, and it'll render it somewhere else on the page. So instead of this increment and decrement, we're going to have a message of set value, which will take a string. We're going to d redefine our model to be a string instead of a value. 
And instead of a button, we're going to have an input, which we'll import. And then in our update, what we want to do is when we get this message of set value and a string, we're going to return a new model containing that string. And I'm fairly sure that I'm, I've messed something up, but that'll give me a chance to show you that the error messages in Elm tend to be extremely helpful. So here what this is saying is that the less parameter in our, so our update when we're setting up our program is not returning the correct type. And I don't want to spend a lot of time debugging this, but this is just an example of the sorts of error messages you get from Elm. So for example, if we go back to our button example, if we were to add, for example, a new message type and we didn't pattern match on it later in our update, it'll tell us you need to account for the, the following branch that you've missed, type other. So then you would just go back and add that inside of your update, for example. And just to wrap up, I, I have uh, just some, how do I on full screen this? Uh, I will slide this out later, but I, I do have some resources if you're interested in learning Elm yourselves. And thank you. <laughs>